Hi everybody, so a very warm welcome to this session. It's a very important session as I was just saying as we were coming into the room. What we're looking at today is um, how to retain existing clients. So very, very important thing in any kind of practice growth is client retention. But we're also going to be looking at what we can do to actually reawaken clients who've become dormant. Now this session is equally applicable to people who are already in practice or if you are still studying and you are hoping to get into practice in the not too distant future. So these techniques are very, very important. Um, I'll, I'll give you an idea of how important it, it is. I was doing a little bit of research, um, some market, marketing, not market research, but marketing research uh, prior to, to uh, this preparing this uh, tutorial. And um, it's very interesting because I was reading up that uh, increasing customer retention by just 5%, so, so hanging on to just 5% of your clients who would otherwise have just wandered away and, and not come back, um, can actually increase your revenue between 25 to 95%. Um, the reason for that is because we're actually thinking and talking about the lifetime value of those particular clients. So what that means is if you've got, say, um, if you've got, say, 100, so just 5%, so you've got 100 clients, if, you know, over the year, if five of those would have wandered away, but there was something you could do to actually retain them, uh, just with just a few little caring bits and bobs that I'll talk about, uh, you know, that could make a massive difference to your bottom line, they say between 25 to 95% return on investment. So um, that's absolutely crucial. Uh, Roberta, we've got a few more people uh, coming in. If you could just admit those as well, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, so what I'm saying is that one very small action, sorry, are you not, just a sec, there we go. Let's let them in. I'm Roberta. not seeing them. Okay, I, I'll keep admitting people. Sorry, that's fine. Sorry, everybody. We had this problem before, didn't we, Roberta, last week? Um, hi, everybody that's just come in. We had this problem before with Roberta not being able to admit people. We checked it before going live today. Everything was fine, but now it's not. So we don't know why that is. It's bizarre. Mercury retrograde. That's what's happening. That's all we know. That's all we can say. So I was just saying, and I'm just going to repeat this um, for the latecomers because um, this is such an interesting thing. I was just saying that before starting uh, this, before uh, putting everything together for this tutorial, I was reading up on marketing facts and figures and, and how to get massive ROI or return on investment. So bigger bang for your buck um, for making small actions, but getting massive return on those actions. Um, and the market research tells us in this area that if you increase your customer retention by just 5%, it can improve revenue and increase your revenue between 25 to 95%. So by just doing very small tweaks to what you're offering in your practice, you can make a massive difference to your bottom line. I think that's really why I wanted to repeat that because it really does bear remembering. I really want you to take that on board. Okay, so, uh, so without further ado, Let's look first of all at how we're going to retain existing clients. Um, so, we're, so stick with me because we're also going to be looking at what to do at the end uh, about the clients that have wandered away somehow and you are, you've probably put them in the dormant file and uh, you know, so is there a way of getting those back? Yes, there is. And we're going to come to that in the end. So stick with me through this. So um, first of all, what I would suggest you do is to get to know your clients. Uh, very, very well to find out what their outside interests are over and above what you are actually directly doing in your practice or even on your courses or your training school. Because one of the things that I've noticed, and I look at a lot of different styles of clinic and styles of practice and styles of training school and so on, to try to learn from, from what they're doing and figure out what seems to be working best and what gives the best return on any kind of either financial investment or um, energetic time investment, that sort of thing. Um, what I'm talking about here is, if you recall, 
when I tell you to go and look at your demographics of the people that you really want to target, um, when you talk, when you look at the psychographics, what their mindset is, how they think, what their beliefs are, their geographics, if you're a geographically related practice or school or, or clinic. And um, all of those things we've talked about in lots of our different um, uh, videos and tutorials so far and you can find all of those on the Complementary Medical Association YouTube channel and of course also in the Jamie Goddard Masterclasses Facebook group where there are a lot of videos there and files there, work, work files that you can actually work through with all this stuff on it. Uh, but each time I do a tutorial I like to just bring you the latest findings as well. So what I'm saying is that when you've done your avatar work and your niche work and so on, what you've done is you've actually been creating a picture of the ideal client that you want to serve. With your niche work, you're also, you've been creating a niche where you can offer something very, very different from anybody else out there, thereby being the go-to expert in that field, okay? So you'll have a very good knowledge of the kind of client, your ideal client, the person that you really, really want to work with. So you'll have good knowledge of them. You'll know kind of what makes them tick. You'll know them sort of inside out, back to front. But what I also want you to do as well for retention purposes is to actually look at what, they, what else they're interested in. So let's say you're an aromatherapist and so they come to you for aromatherapy, you give them beautiful body treatments with the most gorgeous preparations of essential oils that you've created and mixed for them, especially bespoke, lovely, wonderful treatment. I don't doubt that for one minute. It's fabulous. But I would probably guarantee you, and I rarely guarantee anything, but I'd probably guarantee you this, and that is that that person that's coming to you for aromatherapy, chances are they're also really interested in things like meditation or things like mindfulness or uh, possibly, um, I don't know, shopping lists. Um, so because they're probably into staying healthy and eating healthily and so on. So they might like meal planners or they might like um, your like a little uh, first aid kit of essential oils that they could put together for home use. I want you to think very, very laterally with your clients, because if you're able to supply these sorts of things within your practice setting, or if it's students we're talking about in your teaching courses, because I know so many of you do double duty and actually teach as well as practice. Um, you know, what else can you be doing with those stu these students? Now, what I'm saying is, yes, you can, you, can, you can provide these things, or you can give them away free, or you can provide them for a very, very nominal fee, such that these clients really feel that they are being honored for being with you and their loyalty is recognized and appreciated, but also that you've got their interest in heart and that you know them. There's nothing more attractive than feeling seen by somebody, seen and understood. If you can get to that point with your client, then they're going to be with you. You've got their loyalty and loyal clients have a massive lifetime value. And I know that once again, we're talking in terms of, um, you know, we're, we're talking in terms of value, um, finances and so on and so forth. But, you know, I know that you're not, you know, you didn't get into complementary medicine because you thought, well, here's a license to print money. None of us did that. We got into it because we wanted to genuinely help people. That's why we're here. But as I also keep saying, if you don't make things successful from a financial perspective, you won't stay in practice. And so you won't be able to help those people that you look after and that you spend so much time carefully nurturing. So that's what I'm saying is what else can you do? What else can you add into the mix that might be attractive for them? So let's look at some of those things. So for example, what about um, say meditation recordings? These are things that you can either do yourself or you can um, point them, for example, here's a silly example. You could point them to my website, the jamiegoddard.com website where I've got free downloads of um, the Yoga Nidra for deep 
restorative sleep um, recording. So that's an instructional recording. I've got things like the relaxation response. So you could actually say, well, look, you know, this lady, she's the founder of my professional body, but she's got a website. She's got these free giveaways. So if you didn't want to go to the trouble of recording things yourself, you can always do that, you see. And what it does is it sort of underpins your relationship with the organization. So that's just one suggestion. I also really do suggest if you are able to actually make your own recordings. Um, failing that, you could of course contact one of the uh, lovely companies out there that provides uh, CDs. People do still use CDs. Um, so, you know, you could actually possibly get a little selection of CDs uh, within the practice that you could provide at low cost, that sort of thing. So um, what about creating a little ebook? It's very, very simple. You just simply write up a Word document, bring some lovely pictures in. You can get free pictures from places like Unsplash, Pixabay and so on. Um, talking about pictures, you must never take pictures just randomly off the internet, two things. First of all, it's not yours, so you haven't licensed it, don't use it because you could well be sued. Um, and we're not talking about just the value of the picture, we're talking about punitive damages. It happened to a friend of mine, it happened to her twice. Uh, I have a friend called Sherry Rosenthal, Sherry is the expert, the absolute expert in growing and creating retreats, okay? Uh, Sherry is the canniest, canniest businesswoman I've ever met. She's extraordinary. Um, she is a, um, she's a surgeon, former surgeon, and a very, very smart, lovely lady, very, very switched on. Um, the first time on one of her websites many years ago, she did use a picture that she thought was licensed um, to her, but it wasn't. And um, she was contacted by the, uh, the company, um, I, can't, I don't know who it was, but let's say Adobe Stock or one of the stock um, uh, picture companies, and they sued her for $10,000. So that was that, and she had to pay it because it was not her picture. And so that was fine. So not a, not a pleasant experience and $10,000 is $10,000. That's you know, still a lot of money. I don't care who anybody, you know, who anybody is. It's still a lot of money that you'd rather not pay out for a picture that you, know, that you then can't even use. So that was thing one. Then thing two that happened was quite a few years later. Um, this actually happened to Sherry, I believe it was about 20, uh, yeah, about 2013, 2014. So not so long ago she had a uh, web designer create a new website for one of her new ventures. And this web designer had put a picture in that they'd taken from a picture gallery and they had not paid for it. She got a bill for a quarter of a million dollars. Um, and that's what happens. And she had to pay it. So just, you know, so, so, and this was a web designer that she had told in, you know, literally told them only use, we've got this account with Adobe stock um, or whomever it was, she said, use those pictures only. For some reason, that one picture slid through and she had to pay a quarter of a million US dollars. She's a very wealthy lady, but she still didn't want to pay out a quarter of a million dollars. And the reason it's such a high amount is because these are punitive damages. It's to punish you, it's not the value of the picture, it's to punish you for using something that you're not entitled to use. So here endeth the lecture on pictures, but you can go to people, people like Pixabay, you can go to Unsplash. My worry about using Pixabay or Unsplash is I have seen this before. I've seen pictures free on Pixabay and you think, oh, okay, this is licensable under a Creative Commons license. And with Creative Commons, there are different levels of Creative Commons licenses. So you've got to be very careful with that as well, because sometimes you are allowed to use pictures and sometimes you have to use them with certain attributions and so on and so on and so on. So you've got to be very careful. So what we do, and, and so what I have seen though, is pictures that were free on Pixabay or Unsplash or one of those others, suddenly turn up on Dreams Time, which is one picture library that we use, or we also use, uh, we have another subscription to Adobe stock photography. Um, it costs us a lot of money, a lot of US dollars, all these things are priced in US dollars anyway, 
It costs a lot of US dollars every single month, month in, month out. But it does mean that if we are using those pictures, then we know that we're safe because we've actually, we license them, we pay for the license, and then we actually get a certificate of the fact that we've paid for the license so we are totally protected. Because these uh, punitive damages could literally bankrupt, could bankrupt a person. So as I say, I've seen those pictures on, on the free photo libraries suddenly turn up as licensable pictures. And if you had neglected to create or, or attribute your picture when you took it from the free location, if you hadn't attributed it correctly, then it could well be assumed that you've used it without licensing it. So that's, I just wanted to point that out because it's a very, very serious issue. So going back to things that you can give people, I'm sorry, I have digressed, but it's su this is such an important point. Um, okay, so uh, things that you can create. So creating, let's say you want to create an ebook that is related to uh, what you're doing, um, but maybe slightly, slightly kind of diagonally related to what you're doing. So going back to the example of if you're an aromatherapist, um, let's say you've got a, you've done your research with your clients and you know that they are also interested in mindfulness or uh, meditation, that sort of thing. Or let's say you want to create a little book, an ebook of um, essential oils for home use. That's a really lovely little gift to somebody. So all you would do is you create a Word doc bring some beautiful pictures in, bearing in mind what I've just said about photography, making sure those pictures are correctly licensed, and then drop those in, and then you can literally turn that Word doc into a PDF. Now, the reason we do that is because a PDF is not generally editable unless you've got a very, another very expensive piece of software, which, again, We've got several licenses for it uh, through Adobe because we have to edit um, certain types of uh, PDF here. Um, so, so, so essentially, you know, you can create a lovely PDF which you can actually send people as a link. Now, generally speaking, if you're creating a lovely PDF with lots of gorgeous pictures in it, um, and use pictures because people relate to pictures. Pictures, you know, they say a picture tells a thousand words. If you can get some gorgeous artwork in your, your, your freebie, your ebook, then that's lovely. The layouts, you can actually go, for example, if you use Microsoft Word um, or if you use um, Pages, if you're on, on a Mac, um, you can actually, they've got templates for ebooks and such like. So you can create beautiful looking, professional looking things for totally for free, but just using the word processing system you've got already. Um, as I say, uh, using lots of pictures, use very nice layout. Don't go for teeny, tiny, tiny, tiny uh, print. Go for a font size that is at least readable and set your, um, your, 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 your uh, line spacing. <laughs> lost lost my, my track of thought there, train of thought. Set your line spacing at least 1.5 lines apart, not singly, not single line spacing, 1.5, okay? Um, if you remember in previous uh, things that I've, I've spoken about fonts and, and so on, um, remember that on screen it's easier for the human eye to read a sans serif font. So we're talking about things like Verdana, uh, Arial, um, Gil Sans and so on. So they are sans serif. Serifs are the little curly bits and pieces that you see in print fonts, usually speaking. Um, on paper, the human eye has been shown to be able to read serif fonts like Times New Roman, uh, Garamond, and so on, the ones with the little squiggles on them, much more easily. So it depends on whether you believe that your, your client will print it out to read or whether they will look at it on screen. Either way, you can it, it'll inform how you set your fonts. Um, use headings and then subheads just to break the text up and make it much more legible. Um, this is a really nice gift, give it a lovely cover, and also, of course, remember to include your contact details because what we're going to do is encourage our clients to share this, to give it away to their friends. This is not something that you're just giving to them and them only. You do actually want to get something like this new book out as far as you possibly can, far and wide, um, purely because it acts like a calling card for you and the chances are it may well bring new clients to you uh, by doing so. So you've got to keep it relatively relevant to what you do, but also, as I say, with these other bits and pieces, 
that you're creating within your your environment it's it's based on what you've spoke <coughs> on the uh, information excuse me it's been a long long day of talking mm. um these things that you're giving away um or supplying perhaps a you know really very low cost to your clients are all of these things are designed to grow your practice by creating loyalty. So that's really important. Um, a lot of people ask me about loyalty programs. Yes, loyalty cards do work. Uh, the, most, um, the most successful loyalty card that was ever created was Starbucks. Um, so like and more loathe them, uh, Starbucks are a very good um, example to look at when we're looking at uh, marketing strategies and so on, um, because they, they, they do have it right, they know exactly what they're playing at. Um, so what did Starbucks do? They listened to feedback from their clients and then they created uh, uh, cards that you can, loyalty cards, you know, get your sixth or your tenth cup of coffee free, that sort of thing. I'm not sure if they do that in the UK, but I know for sure they, they do that in America. And um, it, does, it has been shown to work very, very well. Of course, you've then got everybody else doing the same thing, Cafe Nero, Costa. You, you know, you can't, you can't breathe for getting a loyalty card these days, can you? But loyalty cards do, do work. Um, they work particularly well for people who are doing massage, aromatherapy, reflexology, body work, that sort of thing works really, really well. Um, for the... Uh, for the, the, the practices like um, traditional Chinese medicine, homeopathy, and so on, um, nutrition and so on, maybe not quite so well. It just depends if it's something that you could try with a few clients and see whether it makes a difference. And the only reason, way that you'll know if these things work is you keep meticulous notes. This is the thing with marketing. People tend to think marketing, oh, it's all glamorous and it's all advertising and so on and so forth. It's actually not. Marketing is a science. Marketing is measuring and making notes and comparing and rejigging and changing and fiddling around and faffing about to see what actually works. What is it that's increasing retention for the purposes of this discussion? Or what is it that's actually increasing an uplift in engagement for your emails? That's the thing. It's all about measuring, testing and measuring, testing and measuring. And so that's how it goes. So remember that if you've got any questions, you can leave them in the chat box. I'm just going to turn my chat box on. So hopefully so far, so good. Any questions so far? Are we, are we all okay? Right, okay. I shall proceed. <laughs> okay, lovely. So, um, right, let's just have, I've got loads and loads. And I didn't, not this whole book, that's not all my notes. So I've got couple of pages of notes. I just want to make sure because there's quite a few interesting intricate bits and pieces to this entire puzzle for retention and reawakening clients. Um, so if you've got um, clients that you've, that, who, who tend to be regular, um, but they haven't seen you for a couple of weeks, should you contact them? Well, when I was uh, training in homeopathy all those decades ago, we were taught that you should not uh, contact your clients. We were told that, you know, it's up to them to come because, you know, homeopathy is so pure that when the client's case changes, they will see that happening and then they will come back to you. And maybe that happened 200 years ago, 300 years ago in Hahnemann's time. Uh, not anymore. We're all too blooming busy and we're all sort of, um, sort of absolutely, uh, you know, we're all up to our eyeballs, aren't we? It, we? You know, we really are. So the fact is that probably somebody's had to cancel, let's say they cancelled, a regular client, they cancelled and then they haven't made another appointment. Is that because you've done something terribly wrong or is it because they're simply very, very busy? I would wager it's the second. They are very, 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 very busy. So what do you do? I personally believe you are doing them a service if you contact them, if you pick up the phone. Um, I don't think it's good enough to just send a text or an email, you can by all means. But personally, I think if you can actually take the time to pick up the phone and say, um, oh, by the way, I know that you wanted to see me and we, you had to cancel. And so I just want to let you know that I'm here and I want to know if you wanted or when when you want to get booked back in. Um, if you do it with a lightness of touch, it doesn't come across as 
creepy and salesy and pushy. It comes across as being a service that you're offering. You care enough to pick up the phone. And you know, it's very rare, isn't it, that in this day and age for somebody to actually call you anymore. You know, we, we communicate via WhatsApp and text and so on. And it's just losing that human touch. So, you know, that's, that's something that you can do. Now, if you can't get hold of the person by phone, then by all means, send them an email or send them a text. I would strongly suggest that you look at using, if you don't use this already, if you look at using one of the online booking systems, because you can simply like Calendly or there are various, there's so many out there. We don't recommend any particular one above any others because there are so many, it's very difficult to choose between them. They will tend to be much of a muchness. We've not seen huge amounts of difference between any of them really. And it all boils down to personal preference. So go take a look at those booking systems. Generally speaking, they are usually free for a basic level, which works very, very well. But if you want it to also send text reminders and if you want it to send emails and if you want it to do all sorts of other bits and pieces and have all the bells and whistles, then you know you then of course obviously have to pay extra, which is absolutely fair enough because that's how you know, companies work. That's fine. Um, but you know if you can't get hold of the person, simply then uh, either leave them a voice message or send them or, or follow up and follow up with a text with a link to your booking system so that they can easily, literally by just clicking on it, they'll go through to your booking system and get themselves booked in with you. If you're using a booking system, remember to mark out the times that you are not available uh, because otherwise you'll end up just having, you know, being all things to all people and running around like a crazy thing and not getting anything done and, you know, just kind of digging yourself into the ground like a tent peg. So, um, I, as I said, I always used to think it was wrong to chase clients until I became the client who had to cancel. And I remember I uh, was going to see my massage chappy and um, I had to cancel because uh, my dad was, I was, when I was nursing my dad and my dad was, was really taking a turn for the worse. So I had to cancel my appointment. Um, I did give good enough notice, so that wasn't too bad. Um, but I didn't then get back to Tony, massage Tony, uh, because I got really busy and so on. And I was really, really grateful that Tony picked up the phone to me and said, hi, are you OK? How's it going? How's your dad doing? Um, would you like, do you feel like you need a treatment at the moment? And I said, Tony, thank you. Thank you for preempting this. I wouldn't have actually had the time or the wherewithal because I'm dealing with so much at the moment. I wouldn't have had the time to actually pick up the phone and look at my diary and so on and so forth. But I really do need to come and see you. And he was literally keeping me going during all that uh, process. So, you know, that was a really welcome, it, it, it can be a really, really welcome call because we're so blooming busy in this day and age that, you know, you are needed, your services are needed. Now, obviously I appreciate that we're in such a weird time now with COVID, so it can be difficult, but um, for those of you who are CMA members, and I think everybody, yeah, I think everybody in this room actually is a CMA member, which is fantastic. Um, you may well have seen the email that Megan sent out yesterday, fabulous email, which were, where Megan has created social media posts just for CMA members. Have you seen that? If you can just nod. Um, if not, great. Did you like it? Did you, I see you saw it, Anne. Did you like it, Anne? Do you think it's useful? Great, great. Okay, lovely. Oh, you saw it, Jill. Great. Yeah, it's. Um, it, I can't see Bianca and I can't see Sandra, so I don't know if you're nodding your way there. Oh, Bianca, you didn't see it. Okay, love, check your emails because it will definitely have come out to you. Um, uh, oh, Sandra's in the process. Okay, Sandra, so we will, as soon as you, you've joined, we'll, re we'll send it out to you so you, you won't be forgotten. Don't worry. You'll also be getting your beautiful membership uh, box as well with all the goodies in it and so on and so forth. Um, so, yeah, so that's a really fabulous thing. So, Megan um, created this fabulous um, set of social media posts. So she created square ones for things like Instagram. She created Facebook posts. She created um, tall stories posts. Uh, so, and it's all, um, see if I can find it for you. Uh, see if I can actually maybe, sh I don't know if it'll work showing you um, in here. Um, see if I can see it. No, maybe it's not gonna come up. Um, hold on there, one second. I want, to I want to show it to you because it's actually rather Fabulous. Um, let me go into promotions because that work came, that's where it came up yesterday. <clears throat> um, by the way, uh, a lot of the things that we send, 
go into what's called the promotions file, um, which is quite annoying uh, because obviously it's not promotions. We're me we're messaging our members, and these are actual uh, you know, these are actually really important um, you know emails that we send you. But uh, hey ho, it goes into promotions. Let's see if I can make one of these bigger for you, if you can actually see it here. Uh, so it's a lovely little post. It says, I'll read it to you first and I'll show it to you. You can be confident that this member of the Complementary Medical Association takes your safety seriously during the pandemic and beyond. So I don't know if you can see, so that is the social post. So you've got that, you've got that version, and you've got uh, all sorts, all sorts of different versions for stories, for posts and so on and so forth. So it's a really, really good thing. Um, so yes, do look in your promotions folder. Um, the way to make sure that you get your CMA um, emails is by essentially whitelisting the CMA. So there's a way you can actually go into your um, email provider and actually click on to whitelist the CMA to, so your server knows that the CMA emails are important and they are relevant to you. They, you know, that you're essentially paying to get these things. Um, right, so, so I thought that was absolutely fantastically useful. So we're also always thinking about other little bits and pieces that we can do to help you with client retention. Um, so, right, yes, so, so with those, uh, let's have a little look, yes. So, that, so we covered off the consistent clients and the ones who had to cancel and you haven't seen them for a couple of weeks. And so it's you know, easy enough just to pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, are you okay? Do you wanna make, you know, do you want to re reset that appointment? Chances are they're gonna say yes. So we don't have to worry too much about those ones. Uh, what about the clients that have been several months since the last appointment? Um, there's nothing wrong with phoning them. Call them back to see how they're doing. Um, now with those ones, I think it's really, really important to check in and see how they're doing. Remembering that they may not have come back because the work that you did went so incredibly well that they are happy, healthy, well and thriving, which is great. But you don't know that. You don't know one way or the other. It's like Schrodinger's cat, isn't it? You know, that cat, that, that, that exercise, it wasn't a real cat, that exercise that, that uh, Schrodinger did, um, you know, he had a cat in a box. Long story, the experiment showed, a bit like the slit, uh, the slit experiment, um, it showed that you can be in two states at once. Um, so, you know, with the clients that we haven't seen for several months, we can't guess because that client may be ecstatically happy and happy and healthy and wonderful and bouncing around like Tigger, or they may be um, actually really not doing too well and just simply not know what to do and probably need a bit of a little prompt and just know that you're there for, you know, you're there for them and you're there to help them. So but how do you find out when well, you pick up the phone and you check in with them and there's nothing wrong with doing that. Nine times out of 10, I would say actually 99.9 .9 times out of 100, um, they will be extremely glad to hear from you. Um, if for some bizarre reason, uh, because I know there's always a little bit of fear in the background, isn't there? You know, gosh, you know, did we say something wrong? Did we do something wrong? You know, it, it, I know that we have these nagging fears as practitioners. We all do. It's totally natural and normal to feel like that. Um, if we have those nagging fears and we think, gosh, you know, maybe I did something wrong, maybe, maybe they're not happy with me or what have you. Well, the point is, you don't know until you pick up the phone. And if they did say something to you then uh, that was a little untoward, well, that's not an attack on you. It's actually data. It's just information. But the chances of that happening are beyond minuscule, beyond minuscule, because you would have known at the time. Let's face it, you know, you, we, we tend to concoct these scenarios in our heads, don't we? But, you know, at the time you'd have noticed something was off. So, you know, so just bear that in mind. So they will be pretty much happy to hear from you. Um, so again, you know, what, why, why are you phoning them? You say, well, just, oh, I haven't seen you for a few months, uh, or six months or a year, what have you. This is, these are all your old dormant clients, okay? Just pick the phone, you're picking up the phone saying, hi, I just wanted to check in with you, just let you know that, you know, I'm still working. I've got um, every, all my PPE sorted out and uh, that everything is going very, very well. I'm here to support you as necessary. And I also wanted to let you know that I'm now offering a six monthly MOT. How are you doing? Ask them how they're getting on and then shut up and let them tell you, okay? That way you gather data. Don't keep talking, 
let them tell you. You've got to listen. An old um, sales manager of mine always used to say, Goddard, because that's what, how they used to talk, talk to us in the 80s, Goddard, you've got two ears and one mouth to be used in that ratio. And his message to me was, when you are selling something, this is a sales environment, when you're selling something, the more important skill is not talking to people. People always think sales is talking, it's not. Sales is listening because you cannot solve a person's problem unless you understand what their problem is in the first place. Sales is not supplying something to somebody that they don't want or need. Selling, when it's done correctly, is meeting a, an established need. Somebody has a problem, you are providing the solution. Okay, that's all sales is. People think, oh, tacky sales. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Well, yeah, it can be tacky if you're not listening. It can be somebody just talking at you, you know, some sort of greasy secondhand car dealer saying, oh, all right, darling, I know what will suit you. You'll look really good in a convertible, little red convertible, darling. Well, no, that's not what we want to hear, is it? <laughs> Quite frankly, um, you know, what we actually want is if we, you know, we, we would, I'm, I'm fairly sure all of us in this room would probably beat a very hasty retreat and uh, go off to somewhere else that actually has a little bit more respect and is actually willing to listen to what we're actually after. That's what selling is, it's listening. So when you contact your, your client who's, who's lapsed and you haven't seen for some time, listen to what they're telling you because that is valuable data, valuable market intelligence that you must write it down. Don't write it on a scrap of paper, get a book for the purpose. I have got so many books, little booklets, they're all for different purposes. And I religiously, meticulously write everything down. By doing that, you get to see pictures emerging. So for example, when I did my um, MSc, my Master, my Master of Science um, uh, research project for my dissertation, what the, the, the um, approach that I used was interviewing practitioners to find out were they thriving in practice, personally and professionally? If they were, why? If they weren't, why not? And it was all about ask the question and then shut up and listen. And those answers were what created enough data for me to be able to extrapolate and pull out and understand why people are successful and why others struggle. And it's all about listening. That's all you have to do. It's ever so, ever so easy. So, um, right. Now, let's have a little look. Oh, yeah. So consider things that you can offer them. I would also say, oh, by the way, I've created an ebook. Oh, I know. I remember you're really interested in meditation, aren't you? Oh, I created a meditation download. It's over on my website if you'd like to go and get it. It's completely free. You know? Or, um, oh, I've got an ebook. I remember you really are, or were really interested in um, essential oils. I've got a little ebook of um, how to use essential oils uh, for well being, general well being, that sort of thing. Obviously, you'd give them oils that were safe to use at home and, and so on and so forth. Maybe um, how about a little booklet on, on how to create uh, things like uh, lip balms and uh, facial cleansers and so on using things like essential oils. I keep coming back to a, a, a aromatherapy at the moment. I don't know quite why I've got aromatherapy in the brain today for some bizarre reason. But let's say you're a nutritionist. Um, what would you do there? Well, perhaps you might create a little ebook of juices and smoothies. Or let's say you are um, working in the field of hypnotherapy and hypnoanalysis and uh, coaching and self-esteem, like for example, Bianca, our lovely Bianca in the group. Well, you know, um, Bianca, you might sort of want to put together something like your top 10 tips to um, uh, building self-esteem that, you know, in your particular market, because I know that you work with very, very specialized groups. You see, so there's, there's, it's endless. What you can actually do is absolutely endless, the way that you can look after people um, and make sure that what you're offering is relevant. Word of warning, please don't just think, oh, I know, I'll create X, Y, Z, and, um, and it'd be completely irrelevant to them, because you might as well not have bothered, because, <laughs> you know, if it's not relevant, they will actually look at you and think, gosh, does she even know me at all? But if you've really asked them, and you've listened, and you know what their interests are, then think about all of these things that are not really directly related to your direct practice, but you know will be valuable for your client. So these are the sorts of things that create loyalty. And as I say, also, if you make sure that you label it all up with your details, 
then people will be able, you know, encourage, encourage people to pass them out to their friends and family because it's a calling card. It's a very, very valuable calling card. Okay. So it's a very, I mean, I, you know, it's a, it's a super tip that. Um, right. Okay. So, okay. Now, what about all the XXXX X clients that you haven't seen for absolute yonks? Um, what I'd like you to do would be to gather all the names of the X clients just put a line under those that you know are completely and utterly out of the question. You're not going to be able to get that person back no matter what. Now, that's not because something bad happened or they didn't like you, but let's say, let's say you're a hands-on practitioner and your practice therefore is very geographical um, and you haven't offered anything online yet. If not, why not? Okay, but let's say COVID, leaving COVID to one side, just for a second, for the sake of this discussion. So let's pretend, wouldn't it be nice that COVID hadn't happened? So if you're totally geographical and you only work in one particular area and that person has moved to Timbuktu, well, the chances are that they may be off your list. Now coming back to reality, and the fact is, of course, COVID has happened. So I'm actually hoping that all of you are starting to look at or have already started finding ways that you can offer services online, because this is the way of the future. And once we're through COVID, you'll be able to do both. And so that adds extra strings to your bows. OK, so can you just let me know in the notes um, if anybody has pivoted to go online yet, have you taken anything online? And if so, what are you offering? If you haven't, just let me know no. Just, just, just let me know if yes or no, because I want to know where we are with this. Or would you like to, but you don't know what to do? Because that might be another issue as well. So just let me know if you don't mind, please. Oh, Bianca's been coaching online. Um, Bianca, am I right in thinking that you've been coaching online prior to COVID as well. I have a feeling you might have been. And what about anybody else? Uh, Sandra is, I have several online clients for my kinesiology and some of my in-person clients have taken advantage of, great, okay. And says, I haven't yet, however, I will be. Okay, great, all right, that's fantastic. Um, does anybody, do any of you need any help with taking things online? Um, Oh, uh, Bianca says that she's been seeing people a bit online prior to COVID, but much more since. Zoom and phone. Brilliant. OK, that's fantastic. So it seems to me as though everybody's kind of got their ducks in a row. But let me know if you need any help at all with um, taking things online. And Jill says, I've been giving talks online and also with health forums. Yes, of course, Jill. Thank you. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. And, uh, you know, uh, I think... Um, I think this is the way to go. I think it is the way of the future, everybody, because it's a lovely idea that, you know, once we are through COVID and we will get through COVID, that we will have all these other things that we can actually offer. Um, so we have a much more rounded service and we can branch out internationally. So we're not just stuck in one particular location. So I think, you know, that is a, it's positive. It's very, very positive and optimistic. So with those people that have moved to Timbuktu and there's no chance you're ever going to see them again, um, just take them off the list and everybody else sit down write yourself a little script telephone script or an email script create a special offer just for those people and contact them tell them about the special offer and ask for feedback as to why they stopped coming okay again they're not going to say anything horrid to you so don't worry what they'll probably say is, I got really busy. Uh, I found that I didn't have time. Uh, these are the, these are the com most common legitimate excuses. I got really busy with the kids. Uh, my appointment times clashed with doing other things that you know the school run or what, whatever. You know, there will be legitimate reasons for people not coming back, and it's probably nearly, I'd say, ninety nine point nine nine percent not going to be to do with you. As a, as a, or what you're offering. But what, so, so, so write down why they stopped coming again in that book, in your notepad, that is your market research notepad, write it down, write the words down that people use. This is really important because it helps you to get into their heads because the more information you have, the more it informs future marketing messages and marketing strategies, okay? 
it's really, really important to know that. The more you know people, the more you know your target market, the better it is for you. So for example, um, yeah, uh, okay, so so we so so going back to my 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 masters, um I I had to actually write down everything down in their own words because there are so many nuances of why people are successful or, or why people aren't successful. And you have to write it down in people's own words because otherwise you lose the, if you put your own, own take on things, if you put your own swing on things um, or your own slant on things, you are skewing the data. So you might as well not bother. If you skew the data because of your own uh, preconceived notions, then you're not actually going to end up with meaningful data. You're going to end up seeing what you want to see rather than actually what people are telling you. So please feel free to ask questions and then literally write down what people say. It's very, very important. Um, okay, so let's have a little look at the questions. Uh, yeah, okay, Anne says, appreciate some, uh, some really, really appreciate some help. Okay, and Bianca says, yes, telehealth seems to be the future. Yes, okay, Anne. Um, in the group, if you could maybe just write a post in Jamie Goddard Masterclasses, maybe write a post about what sort of help you would like with taking things online so that we can actually gauge the interest of other group members and see whether it's actually worth creating a standalone training for that. Because uh, it would be quite a, it would be quite a long session, it'd be sort of certainly more than an hour. Okay, so so that's just you know just a thought, but if you wouldn't mind doing that, that would be brilliant. Um, right, but you know, none of this works if you don't take action. Ultimately, that's what I've got. I've got it written down and underlined with three underlines because if you don't take action, nothing is going to change. If you do take action and you listen carefully, everything can change. So coming back to that point that I made at the beginning, if you can retain just 5% of your, your, your existing clients, just the existing clients, your, it, you can increase your revenue between 25 to 95%, which is a massive return on your investment of time and uh, potentially a little bit of money. But if you add to the picture, bringing patients back or clients back on board who you haven't seen for some time, you thought had wandered off into the great big beyond, well, you know something that's going to dramatically increase your uh, revenue. Um, you could potentially increase your revenue by double that. So 50% to 190, 200%. So it's not to be sniffed at for just a small amount of effort. You can make a massive difference to your bottom line. So that's why we should work on client retention, all about getting to know those clients, and work on reawakening those dormant clients. And it's very easy to do so. So I'm not going to go on too much longer. I just want to uh, throw, throw the floor open um, just to see if anybody actually wants to ask anything. If you would like to, you're more than free, more than welcome, because we've got a small group today, to unmute yourselves if you'd like to actually verbally ask a question, or if you want to pop up any, anything, any questions or points in the chat box, please just let me know. So I'll go quiet for a little bit um, while you have a think and uh, see if there's anything else I can tell you. Okay. Right. All right. That's fine. Okay. So I think we've probably covered everything then in that case, because there don't seem to be any more burning questions. I hope this has been useful. If you can let me know, has it been useful? Is this what you were hoping for? Uh, do you feel that um, I've covered everything for you? Um, give me your feedback. Um, good, intermediate, fair, um, not good, uh, is it useful, has it been a waste of time? I really need to know because uh, I don't want to provide sessions or tutorials for you if they're not useful uh, because you know you've, you haven't got the time to waste and certainly I don't so and, and Roberta doesn't, it's actually Roberta's day off on Fridays and uh, she very kindly actually comes into these sessions and moderates them so you know I just want to say a huge thank you as always to our wonderful, lovely, gorgeous 
darling Roberta, because we love her to bits. <laughs> okay, um, right, so let's just have a quick look. Good, useful, list of jobs to get on with now. Great, okay, good, very good reminders, excellent. Helpful, helpful. Thank you. And thank you, dearest Roberta. Good. Very useful. OK, that's great. Thank you for letting me know, because I need I do need your feedback. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I should go away. I should print this off and actually make sure that I, I look at your questions and I do look at your the points that you raise and so on, because it helps me shape what I'm offering you. OK, so we're, if there aren't any further questions, I shall love you and leave you. I should say thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you so much, Roberta. How did you get a little, how did you get that icon on your? <laughs> okay, I, I, you had a little celebration cone, Roberta. Un, unmute yourself. Roberta, how did you get that little? Yeah, you go to the reactions button. Ah, hey, hey. well, there we go. Right, so I've got a love heart. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. And you have as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. So we learned something new about Zoom as well. How about that? Fantastic. Have a fabulous weekend, everybody. Um, I'll see you here same time next week. And uh, if you've got anything you particularly want me to cover, any burning issues, you can either ask me here, or if it's something that you would like to ask anonymously, if it's just a, a general question, but you, you don't want it to be sort of linked with your name, I'm happy to do that. Happy to do anonymous questions. You can always message me, just private message me, um, either by email or in the Facebook group, group. Okay, take care, everybody. All the very best. Lots of love. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.